Okay. Um, <clears throat> So uh, first of all, I would like to introduce uh, my lovely team members to all of you first, okay? Uh, our principal investigator is Dr. Alex Chen from Hong Kong Xi'an University. <laughs> okay, uh, followed by Dr. Leo Lai from uh, the, university, uh, the Open University of Hong Kong. <laughs> and then we have Dr. Lufana Lai from Gracian Christian College. And we have Dr. Beth Lam from Polytechnic University. Okay. And we have Dr. Raymond Chiu from Hong Kong Xi'an University. <laughs> okay. And actually, uh, I am uh, one of the co-investigators as well. I'm Dr. Nicholson Siu. I'm from Hong Kong Xi'an University as well. <laughs> Thank you so much. Okay. Um, I also would like to introduce uh, a few guests of honors to you. Uh, the first one is actually Professor Selina Chen, the Director of University Research of Hong Kong Xi'an University. Uh, Dr. Alex Lee, the Department Head of Counseling and Psychology of Hong Kong Xi'an University. And uh, Dr. Lam from Hong Kong University, uh, sorry, from the University of Hong Kong. <laughs> she is actually an educational psychologist. Thank you, all the guests coming to our workshops. And first of all, I would like to uh, introduce, uh, sorry, not introduce, but now I would like to invite Professor Selena Chen to deliver the welcoming speech. Professor Chen, please. <laughs> Professor Steger, colleagues, guests, and students, good evening. I'm delighted to be here with all of you today on the third seminar of the Inter-Institutional Development Scheme, Positive Neuroscience Series, co-organized by Hong Kong Xi'an University, the Open University of Hong Kong, and Gracia Christian College. Today, we're very honored to have Professor Steger to deliver a seminar on connecting neuroscience with spirituality and meaning in life. The seminar was supported by the Hong Kong Research Grant Council and was inspired by the earlier project under the Hong Kong Xi'an University Institutional Development Scheme. I believe that the seminar will inspire colleagues for other projects along this line of research. I'm also very pleased to see the university has made significant strides in its research endeavor. Xi Yan was founded in 1971 as a college at the time when university education was a privilege to only 3,000 people. At that time, the college provided tertiary education to those who could not enter the university. The college was a teaching institution. In 2006, Xi Yan College became the first private university in Hong Kong after it was named re, it after it was renamed Hong Kong Xi Yan University by order of the chief executive in council. Now, the university offers both undergraduate degree and postgraduate degrees, MPhil and PhD. Over the years, the university has moved from a teaching-led university to a teaching-led research active university. In the past four years, Xi'an has been granted a total of 28.3 million funding from LGC to support nearly 30 research projects. In addition, this new research complex was opened in January last year, which has provided state-of-the-art advanced facilities that laid a strong basis for reaching our aspiration in the research arena. We will continue to prolong its success by widening our research base that connects researchers and entails integrated learnings across disciplines and institutions. I look forward to a more vibrant research culture for research projects across disciplines and institutions, locally and overseas. And I wish you all a most rewarding and enjoyable time this evening. Thank you.
And the souvenir for uh, Professor Stecker. OK. Professor Stecker, please. Okay. I will take the photo. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, we're done. <laughs> one, two, three. OK, one more. One, two, three. OK, so nowadays we have to have multiple roles. OK, thank you so much for Professor Chen and Professor Stecker. Thank you. Uh, you can take a seat first. OK. So um, today, what is our topic for today? Connecting <laughs> neuroscience with spirituality and meaning in life. OK, so I think everyone come to here is actually looking for meaning, right? Hopefully, yes. And actually, um, when I prepare, when I'm asked to be the MC of today, and I actually uh, do a survey with my student, and I ask them, uh, "What's your meaning of life?" And actually, no one can answer. That that's uh, typical, okay. And then I ask them, "What are the meaningful things that they have to, okay, or they, they have did?" And they answer me, uh, uh, "Going to uh, some uh, poor country in China to do some volunteer teaching, okay." And then I um, come to my mind, and suddenly, okay, doing some volunteer teaching in China is actually quite uh, meaningful to life, okay? And then I'm actually a teacher. So how can I enhance my meaning in life? So should I tell my boss that uh, I do not take the salary, and I actually volunteer myself, and then I conduct the teaching, and this is actually <laughs> achieving the meaning of life, okay? So <laughs> will this be uh, the way that we try to achieve uh, the meaning of life? So uh, we wait for our honorable guest to answer these questions, Professor Stecker. I will have a very brief introduction of Professor Stecker. Uh, he is actually the, uh, I need the paper because it's quite long, uh, <laughs> bibliography, okay? Uh, he is actually the Professor of Counseling and Psychology and Applied Social Psychology at Colorado State University. And he received his PhD uh, for the dual specialization in counseling and personality psychology from the University of Minnesota in 2005. And yes, there are a lot of graduates from Minnesota. So they are quite excited about it. And now we let's clap our big hands to welcome uh, my, uh, Professor Stecker to deliver the speech to us. Thank you. Uh, thank you for these wonderful introductions. It is a pleasure to be here. Uh, I'm very honored to be considered as someone who's welcomed to this important interdisciplinary, interinstitutional uh, research scheme and ambition. So thank you very much. I'll try to be as interdisciplinary as I can. I want to thank personally Dr. Alex Chen for spending time with me, welcoming me, and helping me feel so comfortable here. It doesn't take very much to get most people excited to visit Hong Kong because of its stature as a dynamic, exciting place. I'm also learning that there are demands on life in Hong Kong that sometimes make questions like these a little tricky at times to answer. So part of what I'm hoping we'll do today is open a dialogue. There are many different threads of thinking that come into determination about whether life itself has meaning, whether my life has meaning, where we all fit in in the grand scheme of things, and of course, how all of that gets captured somehow in the very biological parts of ourselves. I'll say that as uh, my introduction declared, I'm not a professor of neuroscience. I don't have a degree in neuroscience. So I'm really coming at this from the perspective of a psychologist who does personality research. I've been a clinician for several years. And I'm very curious about how it is that our little heads can imagine such things that eventually lead to an international group of people coming together to study the same thing. So this is the overview for today. I'm going to move this one more time. <laughs> OK, hopefully, hopefully that's good enough. I'm, I'm taller than I look. Um, I'm two meters. So, is that sympathy? <laughs> 
so um, uh, I might lean forward, but if, if you in the back, if you need me to go higher, just let me know, okay? Do I have your promise? Okay, cool. So I'm going to start with some eternal questions. That's where I began to be curious about this research topic. I'll move on to defining meaning and spirituality as a psychological researcher might do so. I want to pose the question, are we wired for these variables to occur within our experience? I'll do a brief review of the neuroscience research, uh, which we have so far, thank you, Raymond, um, which we've so far started to track. There's obviously not enough, and as most of you who do research in this area know, replication is not guaranteed in many of these cases as well. So um, I'll suggest a, a scheme for how we might move forward in specific neuroscience uh, connections with meaning and spirituality. I want to have some time for practical discussions, and I was encouraged to allow space, and I think it would be great to have uh, some discussion time so we can handle that as, as time allows. Eternal questions. That's not a question, but <laughs> it is an observation. We are, each of us, one among many who are alive today, many who have been alive in the past, many who hopefully will still be yet to come, and we're a very, very, very tiny part of a massive, unfathomably huge and uncaring universe. Well, now what? <laughs> I'm here with you, and I'm concerned about this status we have as insignificant collections of molecules in this huge, vast universe. I'm not the first person who's thought of this. There are literary traditions going back as far as humans have told each other stories, wondering the same thing. What are we supposed to do once we realize the universe is so huge? that we are so small and powerless, and that our lives in these bodies, with these people whom we may care about, will end. So this makes me not very much fun at parties, because I typically will ask questions like, how often do you think about the fact that you will die? Isn't it weird that none of us knows how long our life will be? Yeah, not a lot of laughs usually when I start talking about these things. But to me, this is the eternal and pressing question about our lives. That with every joy that we experience, the importance of that joy is increased knowing that life itself is fairly fragile. It makes us want to leave our mark. This particular photo is of a 36,000-year-old cave painting in Spain, and that person wasn't alone. In fact, you can take a look. Anthropologists have, have taken a look, and they can identify specific artists in some of these cave paintings, because one of the artists has a broken finger, and so it bends. And so one artist from 36,000 years ago we can see that that person existed. But a lot of us wish that we could leave our mark. I would argue that when we lack meaning, we don't always leave the best mark. Does anyone remember this story? Uh, a young man went to the ancient temples at Luxor, and at least as American news stories reported, inscribed on the 6,000-year-old <laughs> 6, walls, Ding Jing Hao was here. And when we lack meaning, we don't always leave the best impression. I don't want to imply that there's only one type of bad tourist out there. There's a wave of European and American tourists who like to take their pants off at temples all around the world and take pictures. Yes, now we can say these two muscly people were at this sacred site. And yes, they did a terrible thing. How do we leave our mark in a good way? Essentially, that's what my research tries to answer. My research covers a few different approaches. I'm interested in meaning in life. What does your life mean to you? 
Uh, mostly I've done that with something called the Meaning in Life Questionnaire, which is a easy to use scale. I've looked at photographic interventions. Has anyone taken a photo today? Raise your hand if you've taken a photo today. Don't be shy. Okay, I have also. If you look at any of those photos, do they tell you something about who you are and what kind of life you hope to be living? Our research suggests yes, and we can use photography as a way to shape the life that we want to live. We've been inventing workshops to help people improve meaning in life. We've conducted cross-cultural research studies, and we do lab and daily process experiments around meaning in life as well. I do research with meaningful work, yet another questionnaire, and also laboratory experiments and field experiments on that topic. And finally, I'm curious about meaning as it arises when we struggle or face conflict in our lives. For today's talk, I think we need to have a brief discussion about what is meant by meaning and spirituality. And I'll start with spirituality. Here there is some disagreement. Spirituality for some is a small part of religiosity. For others, it's a larger thing that includes religiosity. So I'm just going to differentiate religion and spirituality by other experts' definitions. So here religion can be defined as a system of beliefs about supernatural phenomena and practices intended to acknowledge or interact with those beliefs or those phenomena. So here we have both beliefs and then practices that are meant to bring us closer to those, to the target or the object of those beliefs. And spirituality then ends up being somewhat more vague as, generally speaking, a search for the sacred. And in most cases, spirituality is measured just like that, that it's a search for something that is sacred in life, sacred in the world around us. There's also some disagreement about the definition of meaning. I've been working on this topic for quite some time, since 2006, and I think we're close to having some agreement, but people still don't always love what's happening here. In, in general, meaning in life is viewed as a psychological phenomena, which means it's an attitude that you form, and then hence can be studied like any other attitude that people have. So meaning in life here is a subjective judgment one makes regarding one's own life, that it has significance, is understandable and makes sense, and is endowed with a sense of purpose or direction. So in short, meaning in life is, whatever a person, is whenever a person says, my life has positive meaningfulness, which means we have to figure out what they mean by that. In the literature, this, these are the three main components that people seem to access cognitively when they form this judgment. They also access emotional information. For instance, if I put you in a good mood, you're more likely to say your whole life is more meaningful. So these are subjective mental states that we create and consult. And they seem to fall into three categories. The first is coherence, understanding who you are, the world you live in, and the way those two pieces interact. One way to think of that is my life makes sense. It's not chaos. It's not confusion. A second way is purpose, possessing a highly valued, overarching goal or goals that one seeks to pursue over long, long periods of time in one's life, much longer than a goal would be. My life might even have a mission if I have this type of meaning. And finally, significance, judging that one's life has some inherent value and is worth living. So my life is worth it. If you think that my life matters or I make some kind of difference with my existence, then you have this form of meaning also. So if we summarize our two definitions as we move forward, spirituality then is a search for the sacred a seeking of some kind of contact with a world that's bigger than the physical world. And meaning is the judgment that life is worth living, that it makes sense, and that it has some direction or mission to it. There's some family resemblance between these two topics, which is why it makes sense to look at them together. If we're going to assume that there's a neuroscience of meaning, then we have to assume that the brain is prioritizing some sort of organization or function that creates or responds to meaning. If that's the case, then perhaps we've been selected for meaning overall. 
My personal view on this is that meaning making is an intellectual capacity that probably arose to solve different challenges and yet one that we use without intending to in order to create meaning. Three signs that we are maybe perhaps wired or have evolved to create a particular mental state or subjective psychological state is that meaning and spirituality should be prevalent. They shouldn't be rare. We should see signs that they're passed along through generations. And we should see that, that people who possess these qualities have greater health and well-being. So I'll address each of these in turn just to get us all up to speed. With regard to prevalence, these are frequency histograms put together in the largest uh, review of its kind on this topic. And what you see here is an orange bar representing the midpoint. So the orange bar is the neutral point. If you don't have meaning, you'll score here. You can see almost no one does on this scale. This is the older scale. This scale is mine. I tried to do better, but still people kept saying their lives were meaningful. So we see that it's normal across the globe to feel like your life has some degree of meaning. And it may also be normal to wish that your life had a little bit more meaning as well. So we can argue that life is pretty meaningful to most people. It's not an aberration or a mutation. There's only been one study so far. I conducted this research when I was a graduate student in collaboration with Brian Hicks, Robert Kruger, and Tom Bouchard at the Minnesota Twin Family Study. And we can demonstrate that using the very most basic behavior genetic research techniques, that there is evidence for the genetic transmission of meaning as a trait. So if we work through this, we also included measures of spirituality, which makes it convenient for this talk. What we have there is your classic ACE, uh, behavior genetic model, where A stands for additive genetics. This is the type of genes that you would see expressed from generation to generation. C is the shared environmental influence, the similarity between two people that are raised in the same home that cannot be ascribed to genetics. And then E, which stands for environment, but really means everything else, including measurement error, and we're not sure what else is in there. So it's, a, it's not the same thing as a, a single nucleotide polymorphism study. But we can see that in general, we, we get about 0.33 to 0.39 as our estimate of the percentage of variance attributed to additive genetics. So that's very consistent with a lot of other psychological attitudes, similar to some personality variables, but less than others. However, if we take a look at cognitive experiences of spirituality, this is the sort of conscious, mental, and thoughtful approach to spirituality. We see a very strong genetic inclination. This is higher than many personality variables and, and many other attitudes that we typically study. Now the problem is this is North American sample and there's only one of them so we know that these estimates might be different in other samples. One of the pieces that I was appreciative of in this study though was that we can take a look at something called a genetic correlation. Genetic correlations go beyond psychometric correlations by taking a look at whether one family member's score in one particular variable is related across multiple samples to the score in a different variable. So the, maybe the most famous example of this is depression and anxiety. The genetic correlation between depression and anxiety is almost one. So if you have a family member who has depression, you're just as likely yourself to have anxiety as you are to have depression yourself. So here we see that if you have meaning in your life, you're fairly likely to also experience spirituality. And that these things are tied to some sort of biological transmission across generations. So we can say that both meaning and spirituality are heritable, and further that they're somewhat similar to each other. The health and well-being argument for meaning is extremely easy to make. I will just say, there probably is a correlation with almost every variable you can think of when it comes to well-being. 
We have lower levels of psychological distress, including PTSD, depression symptoms, anxiety symptoms, suicide. We have lower levels of bullying. We have lower levels of aggression, all these sorts of things. We have higher levels of happiness, gratitude, life satisfaction, forgiveness. Pretty much, again, almost anything you can think of has been studied now. Um, just using my measure alone that was developed only in 2006, there's something like six or seven hundred studies now, most of which are showing stuff like this. So we know this pretty well. We don't exactly know why all the time. And when it comes to health, we start to see our first, our second, I guess, inclinations that there's a biological component to meaning. First, it's heritable. Second, we are seeing reliable differences in health status based on meaning scores. And it's a lot of them. Pretty much we can cover health, both subjective and physical, less risk for myocardial infarction, which is heart attack, lower risk for strokes, lower risk for cognitive decline and Alzheimer's disease over time. We see higher, better levels of, of glucose levels in the blood of people with, at risk for diabetes. We see less risk for dangerous declines in blood pressure during sleep, which is in turn related to less risk of heart attack, and better sleep overall. Part of the reason is a, a set of, if, you're, if there's stress researchers out there, uh, you see a fairly familiar list of, of um, hormones and other indicators of stress. We see that people who feel a sense of meaning in life have lower levels of physical stress showing up in their bodies, including, lo including lower reactivity to stress as it occurs in laboratory settings. And that's mediated both in terms of reported stress and in sort of biophysical stress like heart rate variability, as well as in hormonal markers of stress and immune markers of stress such as killer T cells and a bunch of inflammatory cytokines. So we see this sort of spiritual variable of meaning showing up in the very bodies that we live in. One of the reasons that might support this is if you invest in your life by finding it meaningful, you're also likely to invest in your health. So if you value your life, you do things that you think are likely to extend it. If you devalue your life, you're more likely to engage in behaviors that foreshorten your life. So here we see drugs, Alcohol, sex, drugs, maybe not rock and roll, but pretty much all of the things that are voluntary health risks, people with meaning in life engage in less frequently. And as a bonus, you're happier, you're nicer to people, you react less to stress, you feel better, and you live longer. I, like, I chose this particular study, this is by Patricia Boyle out of Rush University Medical College in Chicago, Illinois in the US, because they did such a nice job of controlling for other variables. So we have a longitudinal study of older adults with meaning and purpose measured at the beginning, and then two categories of people. So they took the top 10% most meaning in life, that's the blue, and then behind it, not on top of it, but behind it is the least lowest 10% scorers in meaning in life, and that's in red. And you see over time, two, one universal truth, everyone starts to die as we get a little older. And then another maybe surprising truth, that people who feel like their lives are meaningful over a course of five years have a 57% lower hazard of dying over that five-year period of time. And this controls for other contributors to mortality that we are well known in the literature, such as depression, physical disability, and even number of chronic medical conditions. And this isn't the only study that's found that. There have been replications across the board among men, among a wide sample, a uh, generalized epidemiological sample of American adults, older adults in the United States and in Canada, HIV positive men in the United States, heart transplant patients, and cancer and cardiovascular patients. In fact, one of the interesting pieces here is how large some of these samples are and how important meaning is, even when compared to and statistically controlling for other variables that are also important, such as positive or negative emotions, positive relationships, and whether someone's retired. So meaning is contributing independently to the length of our lives.
and it seems to do so through biological mediators of our health. We'll dive into the really complicated stuff now, in case you're not already thinking it's complicated enough. So in the spirituality literature, there's one caveat to be made. A lot of spirituality literature is actually mindfulness literature. So is anyone, everyone here familiar with mindfulness? This is trying to be non-judgmentally rooted in the present moment. Google practices it. Whatever you think about Google, it is not a spiritual organization. It's a for-profit corporation, and it oftentimes says that they're teaching people mental agility. That's not spirituality. So a lot of times what we see in spirituality is spiritual practices that are taken out of their religious or spiritual heritage. So in reading this literature in particular, it's a little tough. I tried to only include then when research that was specifically tied to spiritual practices. There's a lot more research on mindfulness than there is on spirituality. So take that with your caveat. So first, when people engage in spiritually based mindfulness, it may upregulate dopamine, GABA, and acetylcholine. So dopamine, a lot of people think of it as the pleasure neurotransmitter. It's also part of the salience network, so people tend to, to approach when dopamine is upregulated. It also facilitates motor activity. GABA is sort of the universal brain-wide antagonist. It seems to reduce overall uh, agitation in the brain, it makes us feel calm and, and, and relaxed. And acetylcholine seems to support overall level of cognitive functioning. For instance, one of the drugs that shows the most promise with treating Alzheimer's disease symptoms is a acetylcholine agonist. It also seems to downregulate epinephrine and norepinephrine, as well as cortisol. So cortisol is a hormone related with the stress response. Epinephrine and norepinephrine in the brain are, act as neurotransmitters in the body, seem to act as hormones, both of which are related to alarm as well. So mindfulness seems to upregulate neurotransmitter systems that make us feel relatively calm, but also able to process information and downregulate those same neurotransmitter systems that make us feel alarmed and frightened. Other meditative practices seem to have uh, effects on brain activity. So folks who, are, um, folks who are practicing Tibetan forms of meditative practices, this might be Tibetan corpse meditation, it might also be loving kindness meditation, they achieve greater coordination and integration of brain activity. They, we also tend to see greater volume in the brains of long-term me meditation practitioners, particularly in areas related to attention and emotion regulation. And finally, we see greater PFC, prefrontal cortex, activation. And some maybe controversial evidence of something they call left brain asymmetry, where Richie Davidson at the University of Wisconsin in the United States has, has uh, done a lot of ex experimental research of, with MRI focusing on the fact that when people are happy, they tend to have more activity in their left prefrontal cortex relative to their right prefrontal cortex and the opposite is true among people who are depressed. Prayer is a part of most spiritual traditions, and when people engage in spiritually derived prayers, we tend to see more medial frontal and inferior parietal regions, which show increased activity. These regions have also been, process, been associated with social cognition and processing the mental state of other people. So, whereas with meditation, we see people focusing their attention and that being reflected in the attention focusing parts of the brain, here we see prayer as maybe a dialogue being reflected in brain regions that other people have associated with social cognition. In other words, the way that we interact with other people. And depending on the practice, the spiritual practices and rituals might involve a lot of different parts. And it seems that spiritual practices activate the parts of the brain that you would normally expect to be activated by those particular practices. So collective chant, singing, or movement, they may release endorphins, they may be dopaminergic as well. And then of course there's psychoactive substances, which some people take in order to gain a spiritual experience, and those are often mediated by GABA, serotonin, or dopamine, 
Dopamine in particular, as well as serotonin, are implicated in LSD experiences, for example. If we switch over to the neuroscience of meaning, we see some suggestive pieces as well. So we see greater volume of the right insular cortex. This is perhaps part of a reward network. When we see viewing, when people are viewing negative or aversive stimuli, these stimuli oftentimes would show pictures of amputations or traffic accidents, so they tend to be quite visceral. What we see is that folks who are high in meaning spend a longer time judging those photos. So they're able to engage with the difficult stimuli for a longer period of time. They show lower amygdala activity, which in that specific context would be probably associated with lower levels of fear responding, and greater activation of ventral anterior cingulate cortex, which is part of the emotion regulation pathways. We also see greater activity of the default mode network while reading meaningful personal stories. And the theory here goes that the default mode network is responsible for associating various types of information in a self-reflective manner. So people, when they're reading meaningful things, may be actively trying to make links with their own experience. I wanted to circle back real quickly to some of the living longer uh, research. There's been a meta-analysis of 136,000 or more data points, and the relative risk seems to be, across all these studies, a 17% reduction in annual risk of, of dying. So that ends up being fairly significant when you consider that this is stable across country of origin, it's stable across the type of questionnaire that's been used, as well as age, and in several of those cases, across baseline cardiovascular disease status. So regardless of whether you have high levels of cardiovascular disease or low levels of cardiovascular disease, there are protective benefits, it seems, to meaning in life. The question, of course, is do we really want to live longer? Does anyone remember this movie? What, what was this movie? Twilight. Twilight. <laughs> yeah, so this is a 100-year-old man. And how old was his girlfriend? 17 years old. So he stays 100 years old, and he keeps having to date high schoolers, which is problematic on all sorts of levels. I think he, it's also problematic that he, he used to tell her in the movies, I don't, essentially, I don't know if I'm going to kill you or not. I don't know why this series of movies and books was marketed towards young women. Uh, I did not let my daughter watch it. I, I don't want her to be dating 100-year-old serial killers. Call me crazy. But we have to answer the question both of do we want to live longer as well as do we want to live better. Now I might also ask you, is anyone out here, has everyone heard of Alzheimer's disease? Is it frightening to anyone? Is anyone afraid of what might happen if you develop Alzheimer's disease? For a lot of us it looms particularly when your hair turns this color, it starts to loom a little bit more as a potential threat. And this research is from the same research lab, but with a different school, or a different sample, as the folks at Rush University Medical Center, the ones that we showed with the mortality data before. And what we're seeing here is a lower risk for developing Alzheimer's disease. Over here, this is AD, this stands for Alzheimer's disease. And again, I kept the same color scheme. So the the ratio of people developing Alzheimer's disease among low meaning groups was almost three times as high as those among high meaning groups. So that is to say, if you measure meaning at time one, over time you'd expect those who are high in meaning to actually develop Alzheimer's disease at a significantly and substantially lower rate. Now one of the pieces about Alzheimer's disease is that it's typically identified based on physical problems in the brain. Those problems take two forms. There's beta amyloid plaques that form in between neurons, and there's also neurofibrillary tangles. Every time I give, this, give a talk on this topic, I say I'm gonna try to skip over neurofibrillary tangles. It's a mouthful, but essentially this is what's being depicted here. Tau proteins that otherwise form the architecture of neurons begin to unravel. Just like a shoelace that loses the little plastic tip, it starts to go a little bit crazy. And in fact, over time, what you see happening is the tangles will choke its own neuron. 
So a neuron is strangled in its own, its own protein architecture. So you can see this in the brain. Now, they did post-mortems on individuals through this study, and you can see this is the high-meaning person and this is the low-meaning person. Here we have a neurofibrillary tangle, and I think the, the differences are clear. Do you agree? It's so obvious. You'd much rather have the brain of the person high in meaning? No. Do you see any similarities between the two? <laughs> These are not from the study itself. These are just the exact same picture. <laughs> to make a certain point, right? Because we, we know that from this sample, that people develop Alzheimer's disease slower, but their brains looked the same. So controlling for the same level, the physical presence of Alzheimer's disease in the physical brain, what we saw were dramatic reductions in the progress of cognitive decline. So the behavior, the intellectual capacity of people with meaning in life was preserved at three times the rate of those without meaningful meaning in life, controlling for the level to which the disease had physically progressed in their brain. So as your brain accumulates the damage of Alzheimer's disease, meaning somehow helps preserve your cognitive ability to retain who you are, your memories, your decision-making processes. One hypothesis is something called cognitive surplus, where through the process of making meaning all of your life, you're creating additional connections, right? Me with the universe, me with you, me with the nation, me with my neighbor, that you're creating additional surplus neurons that aren't neural connections that aren't necessary just to live day in, day out life, and that those are preserved even as the disease progresses. So that's a form of neuroscience, right? Now, if we summarize all of this research, what we find is that sub there's substantial evidence that meaning and spirituality both have biological implications for our health and well-being. That they would have implications for our well-being probably isn't surprising. They've been important parts of how we view humanity since we've been a species that's able to write about it. However, there's very little evidence that meaning or spirituality uses unique neurological pathways or structures, or neurotransmitter systems than any other sort of positive, appetitive, cognitive state. In part, that could be said that's due to the fact that not a lot of research has been done on these states. It also can be chalked up to the fact that a lot of neuro neurological studies have a difficult time replicating. For instance, determining, determining me versus you at a neurological cognitive level is very easy to access, right? Which of you, are any of you lecturing right now or is that me? That's me, easily done. But it's actually quite hard to detect reliable differences in me versus you processing in the brain. Two different meta-analyses have been published on just that little part of what we're like and they both arrived at different conclusions. So it's gonna be a while before we have rock solid information on something as sort of fundamental as meaning and spirituality. The modality appears influential in linking to bi neurobiology. If you pray as a way of finding meaning and spirituality, most likely social cognitive parts of the brain are going to be recruited in that effort. One of the implications of that is that you may be able to target meaning and spirituality and track whether your intervention is working with, neuro with neuroimaging based on the modality that you choose. Spiritual practices most likely seem to create pos positive benefits, and there are not exactly very many meaning interventions at this point yet. So very few meaning interventions have been published, I think about five or six, and none of them have been tested in any kind of neuroimaging context. We're trying to change that, but it's a little bit tricky. So where might we go next? This part, is a little, <laughs> this part got away from me a little bit. I started getting a little bit excited about this topic. 
And I thought there's really four ways that we can approach this. And I'll, I'll just throw these out there. I'll move along so we have a chance to talk to each other. It's late in the day, and we probably all need to get up and, and chat a little bit. Except for me, I've been doing that now. So there's an empirical approach, right? We can just take a look at the correlations between neuroscience and meaning and spirituality and just say that those are the prob probable substrates of that phenomena. This is the it lights up approach, right? I mean, we just observe naturalistically when people are engaging in topics or when we see group-based differences that have some correlate with neural activity as, uh, as marked or assessed by neural imaging, and then we just say that that's probably where we should start for understanding the phenomena. On the other hand, we can take a look at a theoretical viewpoint and we can ask how, meaning, how theories of meaning and spirituality lead us to create hypotheses about the brain regions or mental states that should comprise those, those phenomena. It's not so dissimilar from the top-down approach where we take meaning and spirituality and we break those into subsidiary tasks that then would be necessary in order to, to create um, a neurally imageable phenomena, right? So meaning itself may not be imageable, but maybe, well, I, this isn't the greatest example because it's, it's not been resolved in the science yet, but determining my life versus your life might be important for determining what my purpose is. And then finally, the bottom up, we could, we could start with the fundamental building blocks of neuroscience, such as simple neural firing and then signal propagation, and then try to figure out where along that pathway does it turn into something we would call meaning and spirituality. And that creates this horrible table. Uh, I was really going to discuss this in quite a lot of detail, but I think I'll just put it out there as a possibility. So if we just take a look at what a theoretical top-down approach would be, we would start to say that we have to understand various abstract states. So meaning in life is going to have something to do with executive functioning at these sorts of levels. If then we move to an empirical version of top-down, we say that we should be able to link these types of functions to known brain regions. And I'm much more familiar with some of these than others, but for instance, abstract reasoning typically seems to recruit the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, ventral medial prefrontal cortex, orbital frontal cortex, and maybe the temporal parietal junction. Self-other differentiation seems often the studies will implicate areas within that temporal parietal function, junction. Social cognition takes place in a lot of places, including anterior cingulate gyrus and fusiform gyrus, time perception, and so on. You can see how you would start with a target. It's almost like um, taking a look at endophenotypes when you're trying to understand genetic studies. And finally, the bottom up, that last, this last column, I had, I had a lot of fun making this one. I was like, how do you start with a neuron and then get my relationship with God and the universe, right? We should be able to do that. At some point, we should be able to do that. And we should then be able to go to, you know, the metabolic precursors for neurotransmitters being transported up and down the neuron and then get to my relationship with God and the universe if we really are going to do a bottom-up science. So this is my effort. Uh, you can use this if you'd like. I can't imagine you will, but, right? <laughs> Neuron fires, goes to single, the signals propagated. That helps us identify a structure. We might see even a small network, network fire, which would hopefully give us a sense that some sequential activation happens. That's a trademark of a particular mental state. Then we go to brain regions, and then we're finally going to recognize where consciousness in the mind occurs, which we don't know how to do yet, but maybe someday we will. Uh, then we get self-relevant -re appraisals. We can't have a meaning of my life unless I know who I am. We form intentions. Events create impressions of moments. Moments compile into a certain episode, right? Your, your, your PhD years might be an episode for you. When your kids were toddlers or nursing, that might be an episode for you. The episode is granted personal significance and symbolized in memory and awareness as an event. The event informs your goals. Okay, I've got my PhD, now what do I do? I have to start publishing really fast. Then you form projects which occur over phases, right? So my first phase of research was creating and developing and supporting the Meaning of Life questionnaire, but that's just a phase. Life tasks, 
give us to, get us to purpose, existence, the cosmos, and whatever's after that. Parallel universes, maybe. Maybe we have to do this all over again many, many times. So anyways, that was just food for thought. Most likely what's going to happen is that we'll start testing. When people say, my life is meaningful, we'll just see what lights up. I have a feeling we'll start with correlational research. Those who, just like with mortality and just like with many other things, we'll start with how can we differentiate people who have a lot of meaning and not so much, have them do a variety of tasks, and then try and build models off of what we see significantly differentiating the two in neuroimaging data. Because the spirit is collaborative interdisciplinary research, I thought I'd throw out a few ideas for everyone here. Hopefully this is interdisciplinary enough. But one of the biggest issues we have with this research, you have a North American talking about a variable that's been studied primarily from a North American and Western European perspective, relying a lot on Aristotle, pretty Western, right? And yeah, we can go around with the meaning in life questionnaire, which some guy from a farming community in Minnesota helped to develop. And we can say, yeah, mainland Chinese folks can answer this questionnaire. Folks from at least nine of the islands of Indonesia can answer these questionnaires. Singapore, South Korea, Thailand, Laos, Japan, Australia, South Africa, all these places can answer this questionnaire. But they can only answer what we're asking them. So what are we not asking them that other cultures around the world besides these Western European rationalist individualist cultures have come up with? So what is meaning from the Hong Kong perspective? Starting from scratch, what is meaning? That's your job, figure it out. Uh, is that different across different provinces of mainland China? Is that different across rural and urban communities spread throughout Southeast China? Uh, Southeast Asia. South Asia versus o Oceania and so on. My instinct is that we're missing the most important stories about meaning. I've done research and have an honorary fellowship at a university in South Africa. And within South Africa, there are 11 official languages. And that doesn't count the oldest people who live there, the Khoisan, who don't have official representation on that list. So it's a country with really 12 official languages and many more cultures behind it. And it's most of those cultures, when you ask a basic question, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? You get subtly different answers. And if that answer is different, then what does it mean to live life well lived is going to be different as well. So that's just one country at the edge of a very large continent. We don't know very much about meaning interventions in neuroscience, like I mentioned. Do meaning practices influence structures over time longitudinally? that they influence levels, accessibility, and prevalence of neurotransmitters and the receptors that are related to them? And can we see that meaning interventions themselves evoke better, neuro, better stress biology? We live in a world that prioritizes youth and novelty, so what lessons about living life well are we missing out on? In particular, those who are successfully aging, what is the secret to their success in the face of a world that seems to prioritize their wisdom less and less every year. And finally, spirituality for the spiritual. I, like, I really like thinking about this. And when I get to the, this last one, hopefully you don't mind too much. But we tend to, in research, strip away the spiritual practices from the spiritual tradition. Yoga, Tai Chi, meditation, all of these things are done as health enhancements around the world with no regard to whatever spiritual worldview developed them. So I always like to say, what if we did the Catholic rosary the same way that people do hot yoga? I mean, we had hot rosary, or hot stations of the cross, or hot Eucharist, right, or whatever it is. Would that offend anyone who practices those traditions, or would they offer a new way of, of finding a grasp with a spiritual tradition? So part of this is to say, we're being quite rude in some ways in the research world and abstracting something that is about the search for sacred from that very search. But also maybe we should look at our own practices in our own particular faith and spiritual traditions and see if there's food for thought there. All right, we're almost done. So the implications for practice. 
I was interested in meaning as a practitioner long before I even thought about ever becoming a researcher. And you see people struggle with meaning in a lot of different ways when they're struggling with hardship in their lives, when they're struggling with trauma, when they're trying to learn how to support someone they care about. And the basic assumption then is that it's normal to strive for these things. It's normal to want lives that are meaningful and it's normal to want to have some experience with some world that's beyond the physically tangible right in front of us. These strivings are supported or at least mediated by biological structures. And in fact, we can trace that support across generations with behavior genetics studies. And the satisfaction of these strivings has actual real uh, implications for how we function. Most people are fairly satisfied and there's overlap between these sorts of things. So the practical implication is that in our, when we're working with people, whether it's working with groups of people in social work all, or individuals in psychotherapy, it should be normal for them to be able to reflect on who they are as people and how they relate to the rest of creation, however they view creation as having originated. And when problems arise in their lives, it's very likely that they have to revise some part of their life story in order to understand the new circumstances in which they live. Having a language for meaning is helpful, and having a language for spirituality is helpful, particularly when people either don't have a faith tradition, maybe they're agnostic, maybe they're atheistic, or when the faith tradition of the, of the practitioner and the client is different. It's a sort of generic language for those deep human strivings that we have and allows us a place to join with them in understanding their experience. And it's real stuff. For whatever reason, it seems to be real stuff if we view biology and life or death as things that are real. All right. Are you ready to have conversations with your neighbors? I think that's a resounding yes. Uh, okay, so I had some questions I'd like to pose here. And I don't know, Alex, how much, Dr. Alex Jan, how much time do we have for this? 10, 15 minutes? Okay, does that sound okay? And part of it is we want to reach across the aisles of disciplines and of universities. So if you can think of some ways in which you can collaborate, that would be fantastic as well. I'll sort of meander around every once in a while. The, it's, it's lucky for you, I won't understand, unfortunately, Cantonese or Mandarin, so I won't know what you're discussing. You could be talking about, you could be talking about social media, I don't know. You could be talking about the amazing Liverpool Football Club, <laughs> hopefully, uh, whatever it is. But it, I would encourage you to take this opportunity to, to think about these and discuss these questions. So what is, do you have any important questions about meaning and spirituality? You came here, maybe you were forced to, maybe you felt guilty, but you did come here and you stayed all the way to the end, which is very impressive. So I'm going to assume that you have a craving for this sort of stuff. What difference does it make to know whether or not meaning and spirituality have some basis in neuroscience? How might neuroscience actually help us better understand meaning and spirituality? If you flip that around. How might meaning and spirituality help us better understand neuroscience? And what are ways that we can provide better health and happiness support to our communities using any combination of meaning, spirituality, and neuroscience? So uh, with that, I will thank you so much for your time and attention and for the great privilege of being able to address you today. Thank you very much, and you can start talking now. Any questions? Yeah. Yes. And thanks very much, Professor, that, that you have given us a very wonderful um, speech about uh, meaning and spirituality. You have given a lot of uh, empirical evidence that shows that uh, the uh, meaning of life and the spirituality that it can promote people's uh, actually uh, well-being on this earth, even their life, okay? So actually, there's one concern that I have. Um, is uh, um, in one uh, actually figure that you show, you uh, distinguish 
issue. Uh, people has no uh, meaning of life, and people have a high meaning of life. So I was uh, questioning myself. So what? Um, so are there any studies about the people who have a high meaning of uh, life? So what are their features? And I think that uh, um, that is quite insightful. And another thing is that we know that uh, uh, there are a lot of consequences that are following by um, meaning of life. So what can promote people's sense of meaning of life? So this is an important thing for the life. But how can we gain the meaning of life? So um, have you ever done any study about that? Yeah, so two, two very interesting questions. And part of it goes to the way that a lot of this research is conducted. So most research in this area uh, looks at meaning on a continuum. If you recall the, the histograms, that's pretty typically. So you'd have, a, you'd have a continuum of meaning, you'd have a continuum of life satisfaction, you'd have a continuum of interleukin-6 levels in the bloodstream, and then you would you know, run a correlation or regression line through a, through a scatter plot. Two times I've done that, okay. Uh, so it's, it's very rare in the literature to, for people to separate out the, the highest extremes, in part because you need very large samples to have an interesting number of people. At just You're only using, in those studies, 20% of the sample. So those are samples that start off with three or 4,000 individuals, track them over time, and then still cut the sample into smaller bits. So um, it's, not, it's not common to do that. You know, you could also, but to get that particular um, hazard ratio, it's a logistic regression method, so you need these sort of binary outcomes and you want to maximize the difference in the groups. In life satisfaction and happiness, there was a set of studies by David Myers and Ed Diener where they looked at the happiest of the happy people and what made them special. And no one has really done that with meaning. I think you don't necessarily need to because if all of the research is using all of the continuum, then the correlational data can be used to characterize people with high meaning. Now where those correlations are strongest is in general happiness type things. So the people with the highest meaning, they just look really happy. They, they don't look serious and grouchy. Uh, and abstractly happy, they, they look joyful as well and loving and all these sorts of things. They look very certain about their beliefs. So almost dogmatic at times. So arriving at a certainty about what you think and what you believe in life, not only correlationally looks like the very meaningful people, but it's a part of a lot of the meaning related interventions that are out there. So I'll just use that as a pivot. Almost anything with a very strong correlation that's been replicated a few times in multiple samples is a good bet for who's got meaning and what they look like. From an intervention standpoint, all of the published interventions have taken place within populations dealing with health issues, so particularly cancer. So there's a lot of cancer recovery groups that are focused on meaning, and they're very much about um, arriving at a narrative to help understand your experience and help give you a rationale for continuing to, to, to struggle through. Um, when we've done, when I've been developing interventions for general populations, I break it down along the lines of those pieces of meaning in life theory. So coherence, for example, could be all about a life narrative. Who am I? Who else is in the world with me? Is the world cruel? Is the world uncaring? Is the world beneficent? You can also think about life story as getting at purpose, the plot. What's the plot of my life? Where am I going? What am I trying to achieve and accomplish? So we focus on values and strengths as areas that people can understand. And there's a lot of psychological, positive psychological research supporting focusing on identifying and using your strengths. Values is less researched, but pretty supported in humanistic psychology, as well as some of the research from Shalom Schwartz and others. We use our photographic method to help people go out and identify things in their lives and be able to use that as a basis for sharing with each other their stories about that. So we try to create connection with people. We try to create connection with things that people want to accomplish that are consistent with their values. And we try to 
try to increase self-concept clarity. So who am I? And those things seem to be part of an overall picture. We've also included pragmatic pieces, like how do you deal with obstacles on your path to achieving your purpose and goals? So some pieces like uh, feedback resonance models, implementation intentions, and, and just very smart goals even, like we teach smart goals. So a lot of those pieces just to try to connect the abstract stuff to what you're going to do today and tomorrow. Okay, thank you. Any questions? Thank you for inspiring the like, talk about meaning of life. As a student, I've never thought about how to age, as it <laughs> seems like a very, very far away uh, journey. But is there a way, or how do you find a purpose as you age and live longer? As you said that uh, being happy and higher on well-being will increase your life, uh, increase your age. And if you achieve too much at a young age, would that reduce the purpose in the older age? Or is there any tips on how to age well while having a high purpose in life? Yeah, definitely. So these are, these are great questions because we don't know what the future holds. I mean, existentialists like to say we don't know what it holds, but it's probably really, really bad. Uh, <laughs> which, again, we're not very much fun at parties. But the overall idea is... From my perspective, teaching a relationship to your own life. So the skills and the competencies to find purpose, that will serve you whether you have one big purpose or you have a purpose and then you, that requires you to work 80 hours a week, but then you have a family, so then you have to work a little bit less. Now you have to have two purposes maybe, and then you want to also Maybe deal, you have to deal with an illness, so now you've got three purposes, right? So overall, we just want to be able to have people familiar and feel comfortable with asking those sorts of questions. Am I doing the thing that I think is important with my life? Not feeling scared by that question, being okay if the answer is not right now, but it's part of something else, or I don't really know. So successful aging seems to be about accumulating wisdom and wisdom is a way of reflecting upon your own experience and pulling bigger messages out of it. So you can have a high purpose life and set for yourself a goal that you never think you'll achieve. And I want to, uh, right, so Bill Gates, the Microsoft founder and philanthropist, one of his big goals is to eradicate deaths by malaria. So humanity has been trying to do that for several tens of thousands of years, but let's say he accomplishes that tomorrow. He likely knows how to build additional purposes. I mean, he built one of the world's largest companies. He's done all these things. So um, learning the skills of just saying, is this me? Is this the values I, that I care about? Does this reflect my responsibilities and obligations to others? If yes, how can I bring this to life? and continue to ask that question. If no, how can I add something of value that speaks to the life I want to live and the life that's important to live? Because I, I know I'm American, and Americans are very selfish, right, in, in a lot of ways. But uh, I, ne I never mean any of this to say, I just get to be selfish and do what I want. That's, that's not actually meaningful. We need to be reflecting on how life responds to our actions as well, and the people we care about and those we owe. So does that help? Okay, great. Thank you. So, any other questions? Yes. Uh, in most of these studies that you presented about the um, associations between meaning of life and uh, well-being, look like that most of the studies focus on the intensities or maybe the uh, degree of the meaning of life, but not the contents of it. Okay, does the contents matter, or just the intensity? Yes. I'm kidding. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, there's one very useful theory out there. It's, it's a mini, mini, mini theory, but it's by Gary Reeker and Paul Wong. 
out of Canada. And they talk about meaning in life, breath, how wide it is, and that's the number of different places from which you get meaning in your life. So maybe it's family, goals, faith, health, leisure activities. If you have lots of those baskets, then no one of those is any more vulnerable to, to, de to defeat. So that's breadth. You want to have meaning coming from lots of different places. There's also depth in their view. And this is uh, very humanistically inspired and psycho and psychodynamically inspired, actually, right? So, so Erickson said, as we mature, we go from, from this terrible little creature to start starting to adapt to life and wanting to give back eventually. And, and looking at, back at our ex existence and saying, yeah, that was a good life, as opposed to that was a terrible life. So we're growing ourselves out. Uh, Allport said that we learn how to socialize ourselves and gradually we expand our sense of self, so, so it includes more and more and more people. And of course, Maslow had the hierarchy of needs, which starts with safety and security needs and goes through self-actualization to his final model had self-transcendence. So that's the, that's the depth idea too, from self-gratification in the moment as a, as a source of meaning, right? Like eating a bunch of chocolate might feel meaningful. So then we think, oh, I should just only eat chocolate my whole life. And that's a very immature way to get meaning, but it's a way to self-transcendence and an orientation to universal values in the cosmos. So that would be the theory that would say that certain sources of meaning that are embracing other people, embracing self-transcendence, they should be better for people. And there are two studies, for sure one study that shows that exact thing, sort of. So people who endorse materialistic aspirations or sources of meaning, uh, I, I feel like my life is meaningful because I'm always trying to be beautiful. Or I feel like my life is meaningful because I've got a lot of money. Those people experience lower well-being across the board, even though they have intensity of meaning in that domain, versus people who are focused on meaning through helping, altruism, being kind to other people. They, they look better off because of the source of their meaning. Does that make sense? But that you are not just saying the intensity, but actually you are trying to say that what types or what kind of meaning would we be helpful? Yeah, my personal opinion and, and uh, based on philosophy and ethics and you know, theology would say, yeah, the type of meaning is really important, that there are certain aspects of being human that are likely to be dead ends as far as meaning go. Um, the data do support that but it's a very small amount of data, and it's all from Germany so far, right? So empirically, it's still an open question, and that's usually where I, I plant my flag is what the data says. But the data so far support that age-old wisdom about being a good person and caring and living with other people in mind, that that's better in terms of meaning as well, so far. But that, that would be also difficult when we go into the contents, talking about what would be good, what would be bad, that's really to have some value laden and there would be a lot of the um, um, discussions or debate yeah. from people from very different traditions. Yeah, it's also interesting, right, because those data are aggregate data and there is a trend in the data, but it's not absolute. You know, it's not as if every person who has self-transcendent source of meaning is flourishing and every person who has materialistic source of meaning is, is despairing. Some are doing great who have materialistic aims and some self-transcendent people are suffering, right? So I never, I have my personal views and my values and I'm happy to own those, but I... You, you noticed I didn't really place a lot of emphasis in my talk on, on that exact part because it's not absolute. So giving advice on what meaning your life should have, even if we were from the exact same culture, same age, same gender, everything, I still wouldn't think that there's enough data for me to say.
Any other questions? Um, thank you very much, Professor Steger. That was very, um, very inspiring and just very thought provoking. Uh, but just to follow up on the, um, that lady's question over there, um, what do you think is stopping the depth of the research in that field? Um, like you said, there are only two studies done. I mean, this has got to be a question that people are asking. And I think humans are genuinely, fundamentally going to ask the question, what is the meaning of life? That's one. But the second, I guess, hypothetical view that I hold is, do you think there's a certain stigma when we talk about this topic? So this is an existential question of what is the meaning of life, especially when you bring it into, for example, um, beyond the academic world, um, especially when you step into um, the work field. Um, and people don't talk about these questions. Um, they just think you just to be a good person. But you, you will find that when you step into the workplace that maybe 70% of people are actually, you know, oh, they're all working really hard, but it feels like there's this emptiness because they're afraid or or there's a certain stigma of asking that kind of question. And, and that actually doesn't help them because, you know, you should be sharing, as you said, you should be responding to the environment around you. So I guess my question is, what do you think is stopping the research? And do you think it's because of a certain stigma associated with that question? Thank you. Yeah, I think you identified a lot of the dynamics that, in, in part, we're encouraged to always seem like we know what we're doing with our lives. And if we say, I don't really know what we're doing, it seems to invite, at best, a lot of advice from people that we don't want to hear. And at worst, a sense of judgment, right? That compared to other people who seem to have it all together, we have no clue and then we feel terrible and it's a vulnerable situation. It do, I, I, the stigma piece is a little bit tricky for me to, to understand sometimes because certainly, um, you know, an athlete has a, wins a, an important event and the athlete says, you know, we really said it, I said it as my purpose or it was, I was blessed by life or, you know, there's certain times when people will call out to these bigger meaning and spirituality pieces. I, I think that for a long time it was seen as a religious Thing. meaning is just religious and we don't talk about that in we don't talk about that comfortably in, in, in sort of academic and science circles and certainly we don't often I would say shouldn't as specialists in a social science field give advice about what religion people should be you know, do you know what I mean so also I think from the existential standpoint the so from mainstream scientific psychology, for a long time it was, too, it was too abstract. We're at the point where we can measure it reliably. We may not measure it perfectly, we for sure don't measure it perfectly, but we can measure it reliably enough that we can do imaging studies, right? So we've gotten to a baseline level. To go deeper is really the interest of people who are true believers now. You know, to the true believers like myself, just to do a study and get it published on meaning for a good decade was very difficult. Um, so, so I think it's a level of engagement. It's easy to throw in these, these measures now and then we generate tons of data. So if you look, if you, you've got that hockey stick of citations and meaning in life, it just exploded around 2007. So, but also existentialists don't believe any of this can really be measured on an aggregate basis. That it's completely Humanists, humanists as well, don't, their ontology is that none of this stuff is, is, can be measurable or compared. So the people who are most invested in understanding the richness of it think that the richness of any one of us is totally irrelevant to the richness of anyone else. And anything I might pretend I know from science is irrelevant to any one person's experience also. So from both sides, you have this reluctance to really write a checklist. I think also the more you research this, the more you realize that every person in here is going to have a slightly different path. So for me, my, main, my, main, my two main professional goals were one, to make it okay to study meaning in a serious way, and two, to try to encourage people to feel comfortable searching for meaning. Just searching for it and doing it openly so that when kids do it, or our elders do it, or people after a divorce do it, or people who've been laid off do it, that it's not an isolating experience and it's not a depressing experience, it's just a tough experience and we share lots of tough experiences. So that's, we're nowhere close, uh, we're pretty good on the first one, not really good on the second one, but that's our cultural decision whether we get to talk about it or not. That's a brilliant question though. The questions have been great. Yes. 
Thank you very much for the wonderful talk. I, I just, I'm just curious about one slide presenting the high meaning versus the low meaning and the relationship uh, with the cognitive functioning with the uh, neuronal uh, fiber. Um, oh, yeah. 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 <laughs> because I, I, I'm studying neuroscience. I'm just curious. Like, uh, did I, did I, uh, yeah, 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 that, 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 that's a, that's it. <laughs> so I, I'm just curious, like you, you said that um, these findings are suggesting that the, uh, the neuro, neuro, neuro are not reflect, uh, reflecting any differences between the two groups, right? But only the, the physical neuro, yeah. Yeah, so, yeah. but uh, do you, would you mind comment, commenting on that? Because, um, well, from my understanding, <laughs> from what I have been studying uh, in, in neuroscience, uh, it's always that um, our brain is reflecting something, uh, uh, some changes along uh, corresponding to the cognitive functioning and different uh, psychological processes. So, uh, would you mind commenting on that? Thank you. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a really exciting finding, and it's also a bit of a it's a bit of a twisted, twisty finding, right? So, so let's say then that these really are two people, and the person on the left is in, I have to do this, right? The person on the left is in the highest 10% of meaning in the sample, and the person on the right is in the lowest 10%. And we're going to control for the observed degree of neurofibrillary tangles. They, they only did that because it was easier to, to, to detect in this particular study, I think. Um, so we would say that the, the morphology or the, the physical presence of Alzheimer's disease it progressed at the same, to the same degree as in both cases. However, the uh, observed cognitive change over that time, the slope is different for the two groups, right? So for whatever reason, as this person's brain became damaged by the fibrillary, neurofibrillary tangles, their cognitive decline tracked that. We'll, we'll, we'll assume that's the, a slightly worse than typical case, but that's the typical case. So as, as, the, as the disease burden builds up in the, in the neural tissue, the, the cognitive decline go, accelerates. In this case, we would have the same growth of disease burden, but preserved cognitive functioning. So, so there's, there's, two quite, there's two ideas about that. One, you could have, and please, neuroscientists, tell me if there's probably more than two, and maybe my two are totally wrong. But my, my understanding and my thinking through of this is there could be two, two possibilities. One, that uh, there is sort of backup tissue, right? Just as if I lose my arm, the neural tissue becomes uh, taken over with my cheek tissue, for instance, appropriated. Uh, maybe the stuff that used to help me remember names and mathematical functions, those original pathways have been damaged, but it's, there's enough tissue to be, recruit into those same functions. The other possibility is uh, a greater degree of connectivity. So as neurons die off, you've got many more synaptic routes to go around that dead end and keep, keep the information flowing. I think those are... Two reasonable thoughts? Does anyone? Yeah? No? Don't know? <laughs> uh, I will. Who are the neuroscientists? Who are the neuroscientists in the room? When, when did this uh, findings publish? 2007, okay. I think. Okay. Yeah. Maybe. <laughs> so it's back then, right? Uh, uh, what, what kind of, like, uh, did they measure other neural correlates or other? Uh, do you know? I think in this study, they measured um, ICD criteria for Alzheimer's. They right. measured, at multiple time points, cognitive functioning, I think intellectual. I can't remember what the intellectual task was. And then they, I don't know what the imaging was, though, for the fibrillary tangles. Probably PET, right? Yeah. Yeah, so. Thank you. Yeah. Yes, just some comments on, on these situations. I actually have uh, the same experience for my thesis. And actually, my, my intervention is doing some uh, meditation uh, interventions. And, and then we tap on the brain functioning of dementia uh, patients to see uh, their changes. And we got the similar results that uh, there is actually no differences from the uh, 
brain imaging uh, photograph on, on the changes on the uh, uh, vascular uh, damage on, on the brain, but uh, the cognitive functions did uh, change. Okay, that means the meditation group have uh, improved the cognitive functions when compared to uh, those didn't attend the meditation's interventions. I think uh, this will happen. Uh, I, I, I remember that I write the explanation for the second options. Uh, that means the remaining uh, synapse actually strengthen uh, the connection between each, each other. But this is actually a suggestion that uh, I propose to explain the data like this. Yes. <laughs> Let him try the bottom up and pre cool Yeah, go for it. <laughs> sure. So I just want to say that this is really uh, exciting uh, news for especially those of us that are closer to the end of aging. That um, it n not the end, but the aging side of life, because uh, you know this is really very exciting. Uh, I wanted to just quickly ask this about this although I had another question first. But this one is, uh, so there's these two pictures, basically are pictures that represent in our brain how it looks in terms of the damage from Alzheimer, something like that. And yet the cognitive functioning differs. So I guess there is no picture yet on the synapses that you you think impl are implied in terms of the, f the different uh, abilities or the different, um, it, it would, seems to me that the synapses and the transmitters picture would be different then if that is indeed the case for the cognitive functioning difference. So yeah, I think, guess there isn't one yet. Well, I mean, do you think like differential tensor imaging would show that effect that you... Uh, to, to my understanding, that is quite... Uh, so far, we do not have a very fine view on how the uh, synchronizations of uh, neurons, between neurons. That is actually talking about the phase shifting uh, or phase at once between the neurons' communications. We just have mathematical models in calculating uh, one neuron transmitting the signals to another neuron. And that's about uh, mathematical assumptions, uh, checking the time and the activations of particular neurons. So uh, to my understanding, there, there are no any visual machines that, that can uh, produce a photograph that about the uh, transmissions of an action potentials between the two neurons. Thank you. Can I ask the question I wanted to ask? And that's really back to the content of uh, meaning um, and then in relationship to spirituality. So that I'm wondering if there's been any um, difference found between the content of meaning, which we had mentioned just now, content in terms of uh, meaning, uh, you know, if chocolate is my meaning, mm -hmm. that's pretty cool, actually. Um, or if it is um, money, that's my meaning. Or maybe my family, my relationships, my meaning. And then further, maybe then to go beyond my own self. Um, versus the strive for the sacred, which is the meaning for spirituality, or meaning related to spirituality. Has there been any differences found in terms of studies for the le level of depth of whether it's influence of spirituality versus meaning in terms of getting money, for example. Has there been contrast or differences found? So the research is, is consistent in the, in the aggregate. When you just look at probabilistic statistical models of scatter plots, essentially, you see it's very unlikely for people who have materialistic aims to score high on meaning measures or spirituality measures. So it's, that's a different way of trying to answer this question because there's not a lot of research. When people do the contents of meaning or what we would in the business call sources of meaning research, the interest oftentimes isn't in comparing one source versus another as being better. Again, because there's a real reluctance to want to be prescriptive about this. Instead, each person has a path, as long as it's sort of ethically bounded within, uh, you know, a beneficent-ish sort of worldview, then it should be fine. Um, they're mostly looking at cultural differences or what's the most common, you know, most common is family and relationships, right? But that's the most common for everything. It's the most common reason people are unhappy too, but, right? So, you know, so we don't want to just say get more family, 
as a meaning intervention. So it leads to some interesting <laughs> conclusions, but ultimately not so useful. Now, I will say that religiousness and meaning tend to co-vary. One of the strongest correlates of meaning in life is religious, uh, religious commitment. So there does seem to be the sense that when you do find yourself pulled towards this sort of sacred approach, and it finds a, a community, and it feels intrinsic. So there's another thing called extrinsic religiosity, right? Where people are attending religious services, but not for spiritual reasons. Maybe it's to drum up business, or out of guilt to parents, or whatever it is, you know. In my small, my, my, my hometown, the church bulletin uh, always had insurance agent advertisements on, on the back. So, you know, you'd see people shaking hands really fast outside the church. You knew they were there. There's the insurance people, right? So, uh, you know, they might also have been there to really f feel pulled towards something sacred, but they were for sure there for other reasons as well. So there's a critical piece there, and you could see that as, as on that continuum. So if you're going to a religious service just to do business, that's kind of like a materialistic version of spirituality, right? And if you're going there because it really resonates with you, you find the experience worth it in and of, of itself, while it may not be self-transcendent, at least it's, it's intrinsic, and those sort of values-linked motivational constructs, intrinsic motivation, extrinsic motivation, intrinsic values, extrinsic values. In the workplace as well, intrinsic motivation for work is a better predictor of good outcomes than extrinsic motivation. You know, you can only carrot stick people so much. So it seems to bear out in, in that sort of way as well. Thank you. I would like to ask, is there differences in terms of efficacy of enhancing meaning in life? As meaning in life comprises of three components, purpose, comprehension, and this how one finds significance in life. So if a person wants to improve their sense of meaning, is there differences to improve on any one of these components? Thank you. That's a really great question. I wish I had a great answer. Um, those three components currently are not, have not been measured separately in the literature very often. There are, there are little bits of, there's one scale that exists right now by Logan George and Crystal Park that came out in 2016. And I myself am working on a version with a collaborator at University of Helsinki, Frank Martela. Uh, we hope to have ours out, well, We'll get our, we're looking forward to our first rejection uh, the, in October and our second rejection and revised resubmit in November and you know, that's how that goes. But, um, so then we, our, our specific aim is to link that to not interventions yet, but to social psychology experiments. So for instance, you can show someone a very, very confusing movie clip. That this is like, what is happening here? And you would expect that that would that would create a momentary challenge to coherence, right? Our, my ability to make sense. The way that we've structured it in our interventions, and we haven't done a dismantling study yet where we've shuffled the components around and reordered them, we, th we think that it makes the most sense to start with coherence. But you could make an equally strong argument that you would start with uh, significance. The significance argument is that it links with something called reasons for living, there's a little bit of a reasons for living research area out there that's highly predictive of suicide at intentions. And so I think if you're thinking it's an option to destroy your own life, that's a good place to start for an intervention that's going to improve your life. So um, particularly with kids, I think with kids, they oftentimes are working over a long period of time through adolescence into young adulthood on the who am I and what's, where am I in the world? But they oftentimes will put together uh, significance and purpose. I'm a good person because I help people, or I'm a good person because I'm nice on the playground, or you know what I mean? So I think there's some really natural places. It's very difficult to imagine someone feeling their life is meaningful if they think it's not worth living and it doesn't matter, right? So I, I think either of those two places make sense. Purpose. You know, purpose evolves over time.
quite a bit. And I know that my purpose is different now than it was 10 years ago, and I've got more of them, it seems like. So it's a great question, but we're five years out from knowing, probably. OK, so any further questions? Yes. Thank you so much for the wonderful talk. Um, some research drive from the terror management theory demonstrate that even subtle reminder of mortality uh, increase striving for meaning. So do you think when people after they went to a funeral, they have higher level of meaning in life? If so, is there any neurological uh, explanation for this phenomenon? Yeah, so terror management theory is, is pretty interesting, right? So in, in general, terror management theory starts with a lot of the same types of things I talked about. We know we exist, and we know we will someday not exist, right? And um, Ernest, Becker's Ernest Becker's theory about humanity was that we create all sorts of cultural institutions to protect ourselves from the knowledge that we are animals, and if you've ever been to the market or eaten a meal, you know what can happen to animals, and it can happen to us too. So we start with that. And actually, I open my talks with that almost every time. So hopefully, you've all found meaning just because I did that. Um, but the research then says that when, we've, when we're reminded about our own mortality in subtle ways, in obvious ways, we can, we can attack that very quickly and directly. We can say, oh, death is a long ways away. Oh, uh, you know, I had a grandparent who lived to 95. I'm only 26, not me, but I'm, you know, something different. But when we don't get to a chance to consciously attack that, then we have to resort to all these really almost psychodynamic sounding defenses, but they've been shown in hundreds of studies in social psychology laboratories. So one of them is to defend a cultural worldview. So the key pivot there, we, we don't necessarily search for meaning in those cases, but meaning is a good way of, of getting over the threat to our own mortality. So one of the ways in which we do this is called symbolic immortality. You know, the person who wrote their name on the Temple of Luxor, or anyone who's been excited to um, have a street named after him or her, right? I mean, we live on somehow. And therefore, our death isn't as alarming to us because some part of us survived. Some people would say that that's a lot of the religious impulse, is to believe that we survive even once our, our bodies decay. But we can symbolically become immortal by being a part of something bigger than ourselves as well. So it's, it's that defense piece that then preserves meaning, but meaning also, people who have a lot of meaning tend to respond a little bit less strongly to those sorts, of, those sorts of reminders. So in the context of a funeral, you're confronting death very, very upfront for most people. Most of the time, if we don't get a chance to directly confront it, we actually do worse things, right? We, are, we, uh, we become more xenophobic. We hate people from other cultures more. We want to punish people who are lawbreakers more severely even ridiculously severely. I think it was, there was a study um, where they, they reminded people of their death and then gave them a distractor task so they weren't able to dir direct their attention. And they said, okay, so here's a prostitute and you're a judge. I want you to set the fine. And the average fine of people who didn't think about death was maybe $775 or 750 Hong Kong dollars. And the average fine of people who were reminded of death was 7,500. So it was just, you know, you can see this actually, this the very same phenomena occurring in the United States. As people become more anxious, they become more vindictive against people who have nothing to do with the source of their anxiety. Um, they're more likely to vote for Trump, for instance. That's data from laboratories, so I did not, not an opinion. So. <laughs> so it's finding a good way to deal with that. And meaning is, forming meaning is one good way. Becoming part of something in a welcoming way that's bigger than ourselves is, is important too. At a funeral, it, I don't know how you don't know you're at a funeral, right? So you do have a chance to openly discuss what that person's life meant and how you'll carry on. So I think it's much more of a conscious meaning-making process than that automatic cultural defense approach. 
I don't know what neuro, neuro, neuroscience would say about it other than um, whatever neuroscience says about the way in which we create narrative associative memory networks, right? So it's probably refashioning some links, probably revisiting some links. So that's my guess. Okay, thank you very much for, for the insightful talk. Let's give our back hands to Professor Stecker. And may I now invite Dr. Alex Chen on behalf of our IDS team to present the souvenir to Professor Stecker. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I told okay. you I was tall. I'm worried all of you. No, I'm not that short. No, no. Okay. Thank you so it's much. It's my fault. <laughs> Thank you so much. So uh, we would invite the IIDS team to take the p pictures and also the guests. Uh, we have a short, very short questionnaire. We would like to get you some feedback or comments. Please uh, fill in the short questionnaires and uh, give a best, give our staff or help us back uh, before you go. Thank you. Uh, we'll take a photo together. You, you like? We can yeah. join together to take yeah. a photo. Uh, let's, let me do this. Yeah, that's better. Yeah. Okay. Let's see. Let's see. Uh, we have the final address from our principal investigator, Dr. Alex Chen. Oh, thank you. Uh, first of all, uh, thank you so much for Professor Stenger uh, for his one wonderful, uh, inspiring, and meaningful talk. Uh, let's let us give uh, him some big hands again. Thank you. <laughs> and also, uh, on behalf of uh, the IIDS team, we greatly appreciate appreciate your presence. Your presence.